Coming up next, the story about one of the best-selling singles of 1980, one of the most recognizable for sure. Although the song was a tribute to an all-time legend, the song had nothing to do with this star other than being a sound-alike. In fact, it sounded so much like this legend, many people were fooled into thinking it was his new single. It was actually conceived while one of the biggest musical icons was taking a bubble bath. He jumped out of the bubble bath immediately, got a guitar, even though he didn't really play, and he wrote it in mere minutes. The crazy details of this international smash that was rushed from a hotel bathtub to a recording studio, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember racing your friends your favorite Hot Wheels or Matchbox car, racing against them. You're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button, click the bell, the notification bell, so you know when our interviews and our videos come out. Also check us out on Patreon and our merch below that helps us curate this and make it a daily channel. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. In the world of rock and roll, reality so often beats fiction. That's what makes these stories so thrilling and unexpected. Throughout the rock era, hit records, they sprung from all sorts of places, sometimes out of the blue. I'm sure some artists may have had a formula, but for the four members of Queen, it was more like a spontaneous trip to the studio with little or no ideas in mind at all. And when it came to their biggest chart hit, the spark of inspiration struck Freddie Mercury while he was enjoying a bubble bath at uh, a hotel in Munich, Germany. I mean, do you recall the last time that you had a bubble bath? Or even just a nice hot soak in the tub? For me, it's been ages, I think since I was maybe a little boy. But I remember that having a bubble bath was a rare treat, right, to play with my toys and everything. For Freddie Mercury, having a bubble bath was one of his favorite ways to pamper himself. It was also a cherished escape from the demands of, of rock stardom. Whenever he could steal a moment, he enjoyed a nice, relaxing bath. That was his thing. Having a bathtub in his suite, it was a non-negotiable requirement, something hotel management simply had to accommodate if they were gonna have Queen in their hotel. So as the 1970s came to a close, Freddie Mercury and Queen found themselves in a bit of a slump, actually. The band was striving to regain their momentum following the underwhelming sales of the jazz album in 1978. Now, jazz wasn't a flop necessarily. Its sales, though, fell significantly short of the high standards set by Queen's previous album, News of the World, released the year before. News of the World has sold over four million units compared to just two and a half million for jazz. I mean, still, any band would kill for either of those numbers. But the band was in Munich because they had heard that there was a great studio called Musicland. Ah, Musicland, that sounds like that old record store chain that had locations in shopping malls in the 80s. Yeah, I love Musicland and Tower Records and Record Town and Sam Goody, all those back in the day, depending on where you lived. Musicland, we bring entertainment to life. Musicland. The Queen Quartet had found a studio to record their next record, but other than the glowing recommendation of where to make that album, they really had nothing. They were fresh out of ideas for new material. They're having a little bit of a writer's block. It was all par for the course for Queen during that period. By 1979, the band's approach to creating music for a new album had become rather indulgent. According to Brian May, the group had developed a bit of a tendency of bowling into the studio with little or no ideas and just do it. That lack of focus could certainly have contributed to the sales dip on jazz. Okay, so stay with me. Imagine Freddie Mercury soaking in a bathtub full of bubbles, and then suddenly, he struck with an idea for a song, a great song. It's exactly what happened when he came up with a crazy little thing called love in his hotel suite in Munich. Luckily, Peter Hans, Queen's tour manager, was right there to help out on the scene and uh, to recount how it all went down. I actually talked about it in uh, Mojo Magazine's September 2009 issue. Apparently, Freddie was freaking out. He was singing something while he was taking a bath. Then he emerged yelling at Peter for a guitar. Quick, throw it to me. 
Peter quickly handed Freddie a nearby guitar and Freddie immediately worked out the chords. Now, I've heard some rumors that he had his guitar in the bathtub with him trying to figure it out. But from Peter, Freddie had a towel around him just getting the song worked out ASAP. As we all know, Freddie had an amazing gift for recognizing a catchy lyrical hook for a song. Freddie revealed that he composed crazy little thing called love in less than 10 minutes. May have been even faster than that because the chorus hit, you know, while he was relaxing in the tub. He came up with the verses while wrapped in the towel, strumming the guitar that Peter gave him. It was all done before he even dried off. Freddie was self-deprecating about his guitar skills. He said that he was never a very good player, his words. He certainly was known Brian May, but for Crazy Little Thing Called Love, Freddie didn't need to be a guitar virtuoso. He embraced the song's minimalist rockabilly vibe, which was a big part of the song's ultimate appeal, right? He didn't overthink it. He discovered that sticking to a basic framework helped him stay disciplined and focused on crafting what became just a simple, uh, catchy tune. The simplicity made it the massive hit it became, and it's still an easy, catchy song for any beginning guitarist to play. Now, Peter Hintz, affectionately known as Ratty, he continued his vivid account of what happened next. The second after Freddie conceived Crazy Little Thing Called Love, he threw on some clothes straight away, and the two of them rushed over to Musicland Studios. They wanted to capture the song immediately before it slipped away. This was, again, before iPhones and such. As the artist motto goes, when you find it, don't lose it. He knew he had a smash hit. When they got to the studio and Freddie hurried into the vocal booth, he deliberately channeled Elvis Presley's style in his vocal delivery as a tribute to the king, uh, who was one of his childhood heroes. Even though Elvis had passed more than two years before the release of Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and when the single began to get its massive airplay, Many listeners thought that it was Elvis. They thought it was like a lost track that was posthumously released. I mean, Freddie did such a great Elvis impersonation, it was just spot on. You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. As Ratty told us, Freddie tried to fast track his bathtub brainstorm, so by the time Brian May arrived to the studio, the song was nearly finished. Brian highlighted the crucial role of sound engineer Reinhold Mack in swiftly capturing the essence of the track. He remarked, and I quote, the sounds Mack achieved, these raw, authentic studio ambiances, were pivotal in shaping the final outcome. It possesses a genuine rock and roll essence in every aspect, end of quote. Crazy little thing called love commanded the authenticity uh, that Brian May recognized. As they neared completion of the track, Reinhold Max suggested adding a guitar solo to enhance that authenticity, right? Brian reluctantly played Roger Taylor's worn out natural wood telecaster, admitting he was coaxed into using it. Now he noted that this particular instrument didn't suit his style at all. But after some heavy persuasion, Brian relented, telling Mac, if you set it up, I'll play it. Brian was also uncomfortable with the Mesa boogie amplifier that Mac chose, but he followed Mac's lead and was ultimately satisfied with the outcome of the solo. I believe Brian's comment was, it sounded okay. Amidst the praise that Brian gave to Mac, there's actually a funny side note to this story. Now it's true that Freddie wanted to get to the studio as fast as he could so that he could capture the the spontaneous magic and excitement of crazy little thing called love, right? Before he forgot it. But Freddie and Mac also wanted to record as much of the song as possible before Brian May arrived because they knew that Brian's slow, analytical approach would change the mood of the session and kind of drag out the entire process. Mac laughed when Freddie told him to hurry and set everything up so that Brian had no choice but to just roll with it. In addition to lending Brian his old Telecaster for the solo, Roger Taylor played the drums. He also provided hand claps and delivered one of the best parts of the song when he sang the pop culture classic, 
ready, ready. Of course, at the end of the third verse. Ready, ready, raise a little thing all over. The phrase Ready Freddy was a derivative from the tune Ready Teddy, written by John Mariscalco and Robert Blackwell, of course popularized in a fiery performance by Little Richard from 1956. Ready, Ready Freddy became an important part of Queen's live performances of Crazy Little Thing Called Love, much to the delight of fans, right? On stage, Brian May often rotated between three different guitars throughout the song. Freddie started with his guitar for the first verse, and then Brian joined in with another ovation acoustic. And then by the third verse, Brian had switched to a Telecaster for the solo. During the sing-along section, known for its Ready Freddie line, Brian switched back to his homemade Red Special. Three guitars. Uh, from 1984 onward, Freddie replaced the acoustic with another Telecaster. As we continue to break down this classic, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. As we continue with this, uh, man, Zenny is the best. Right now, you can choose from a variety of different frames to fit your need. You know, whatever needs you have, from readers to migraine relief glasses, transition lenses, progressives, blue blocks to protect your eyes from digital blue light. You can shop by frame size, color, design. You can design your own pair. You can get up to 80% off regular retail prices. Just click right up here to get that special deal. Now, as usual, Roger Taylor was stellar on the drums on Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and John Deacon definitely kept the song groovy with his bass licks. The hand clap breakdown during verse three was an eight hand collaboration by all four band members of Queen. Gotta love those hand claps. Having created Crazy Little Thing Called Love on guitar, Ready Freddy took on rhythm guitar duties during live performances of the song. It actually marked his debut playing guitar on stage with Queen, this song. So Freddie performed live with an acoustic electric 12 string ovation pacemaker 1615. He later switched to an electric six string Fender Telecaster, like I said, both of these were borrowed uh, from Brian May. By the way, he opted for a six string acoustic guitar with external microphones for the studio recording of the song to be specific. Not many know that Freddie actually played the first guitar solo for Crazy Little Thing Called Love. This was before Brian came to the impromptu recording session. Unfortunately, though, we'll never be able to hear that version because somehow it was lost. After Freddie repeatedly denigrated his guitar playing, his bandmates, including Brian May, came to his defense. All three of them said that Freddie was genuinely a very good guitarist. Freddie would often play guitar solos during recording sessions and band rehearsals, eh, just for the fun of it. Okay, sure. Uh Crazy Little Thing Called Love was included on Queen's eighth studio LP, The Game, and on their 1981 Greatest Hits compilation. Initially, the track wasn't released as a single in the U.S. However, due to radio stations playing imported copies of the single before the game was released, Elektra, Queen's record label in the States, decided to put it out as a single in North America about three months after its debut in England. So an import is the reason it became a number one hit. And of course, it was a monster all over the world. It was number one in Ireland, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, it went to number two in the UK and New Zealand, and number three in South Africa and Belgium. But perhaps the pinnacle of success for Crazy Little Thing Called Love was its amazing popularity in Australia. And also here, it was actually Queen's first number one hit in the United States, maintaining the top position for four consecutive weeks while achieving platinum success. Uh, sold over a million copies. But in Australia, Crazy Little Thing Called Love was the number one song in the land for seven consecutive weeks. It'd be the final single release in the 70s for Queen, and really a hell of a way to break into a new decade. One of the biggest hits in 1980. <laughs> 
In 1999, Dwight Yoakam released a cover of Crazy Little Thing Called Love that climbed to number 12 on the US Hot Country Songs chart. Dwight's rendition also featured in the movie The Breakup, starring Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston in 2006. Some other notable remakes include versions by Maroon 5, Michael Buble, Josh Kelly, and also a collaboration between Brian May and Diana Ross. The music of Queen has been so influential to so many artists. Freddie Mercury is always in the conversation for the greatest singer frontman of all time, always. Brian May, always in the conversation for one of the greatest guitarists. Roger Taylor, one of the best drummers. John Deacon is one of the most respected bass players ever. The theatrical emotion of the music is one of the driving characteristics of what made Queen so great. Now, it's not been proven by an interview or a document, but both Brian and Roger have commented about a legend they believe to be true about John Lennon. Brian and Roger have declared that John Lennon was truly captivated by Crazy Little Thing Called Love. And the song actually inspired him to create Just Like Starting Over. Of course, the lead track from his brilliant 1980 comeback, Double Fantasy. Again, there's not been any validation to those claims, but John did mix it up and injected a lot of different styles into that record. Definitely some 50s stuff. Starting Over it has elements of old rock and roll to it, just like Crazy Little Thing Called Love. May have been one of the songs to really ignite John to get back into the into the business. This was always a favorite song of mine when I was really little. My dad turned on the radio one day. I was riding along with him in, in his pickup and it came on halfway through the song, I'm singing every word with him. My dad, he brought the record home a few days later and I begged him to play it on our uh, family turntable every single day. I swear it was his least favorite Queen song because I had him play it all the time. I'd sit there and dance and do my Elvis impersonation and my dad would laugh and have a fun time. But again, I think he just hated it by the end. As a tribute to Elvis Presley, crazy little thing called love, Freddie truly honored the king of rock and roll, as well as paying indebted gratitude and reverence to the roots of rock and roll. He also gifted us with one of the most endearing, finger-snapping classics of the rock era to enjoy over and over again, as well as a new source to inspire creative innovation. A nice hot bubble bath. How about that? Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Queen and Crazy Little Thing Called Love. What do you think about the song? What did you think when you first heard it? Did you think it was Elvis? So interesting that people thought that. And, you know, write a song in a bubble bath. Only Freddie Mercury, right? Let's have a great discussion honoring Queen, honoring the roots of rock and roll. And John Lennon's comeback, should I cover start, uh, Just Like Starting Over? Uh, great song. Double fantasy, maybe. Let me know below. Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.